Germans drink over 133 million cups of tea every day. And they're often more discerning than they used to be because they want to know if they're really holding a good cup in their hands. People actually making the tea in the factories, they don't almost get anything. Tea drinkers' ever more exacting demands are pushing producers to get more creative. We always take a step further and ask, is that available in Germany too? And many companies show how climate protection and tea production can go hand in hand. That it will also reduce my tea production cost by 15%. And more and more tea drinkers want to have a positive impact. Well, I will be surprised if they make seven, or six or seven kilos per day. I think they will also go to the other plot later. In Western Georgia, Kristina Mehik from Estonia and Tomas Katsilionas from Lithuania are reinventing tea production and getting a fresh start themselves. Four years ago, they tried their hand at farming for the very first time and began a new life 3,000 kilometers from home. Well, if you want to take only highest quality leaves, you have to do it by hand because uh, well, it would be impossible to cut it uh, mechanically on the, this two leaves on the bud level. If, if it goes mechanically, it takes everything, those... Uh, hard and all leaves as well. In Estonia, Kristina Mehek used to work as a marketing expert for a bus company, but now she heads a tea plantation. It's the best way to be like in connection with the nature actually, so you can actually, you see them growing like, uh, like in the spring when they actually start to, like the first small ones start to grow. It's really like an amazing feeling. And tea has a long tradition in Georgia. In Soviet times, 90% of the tea for the gigantic multi-ethnic state was produced here, using machinery and pesticides. But the tea production at the foot of the Caucasus Mountains ended up collapsing along with the Soviet Union 30 years ago. And the once flourishing business gave way to poverty. A few years ago, Kristina remembered the Georgian tea she used to always drink with her parents. And then she wondered why no one drank it anymore. And we started to look into it, like what has happened to this uh, tea in Georgia. And we understood that it has collapsed completely. So this kind of like sparked this idea. So it got really interesting then. And we contacted the people here. Of course, they didn't believe us at first. So like. Estonians want to grow tea, <laughs> like that doesn't sound like very like logical or real. But, uh, but when we got here, then they were like, yeah, okay, you're serious. Along with a few friends, Kristina Mehik and Tomas Katsilionas decided to take the plunge, quit their jobs and start new lives. I was quite successful in this corporate business, but I didn't have a feeling that I'm actually creating something. There were those Excel tables, those meetings, present point presentations, and, and, and so on and so on. But uh, I didn't have a feeling that I actually make something that would, well, left a footprint in this world. And when I heard about this idea, I thought, well, this is it. It's either now or never. Here at the border of Asia, the damp subtropical climate and acidic soil are ideal for tea, but also for weeds. It took months to clear the old fields. They finally rid this field of ferns just three weeks ago. I think we never actually thought about it. Like people kept telling us, like, are you stupid? Like, just put something on it. Like, or like, uh, I think there was even like a joke, like some person like said that like, like a worker, like just put something no one will know. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's not how it goes. So, so it's like in our, in our minds that was like never an option. 
And they're part of a real trend. In Germany, the amount of black and green tea farmed organically rose by about 1% to 12.9% in 2020, while fruit and herbal teas increased by 2.5% to 13.5%. Mizia Kinsurashvili and the other tea pickers are benefiting from the new organic tea idea. They worked on plantations as young women, and they're back at it again decades later. 3.34 kilograms. Super chai, super. <laughs> the 69-year-old works six days a week, making about 20 euros a shift. I really like this setup. I'm retired, but I can't make ends meet with my pension. So that's why I'm out here picking tea. And I'm really thankful. I'm very happy to do it because this job gives me enough money to buy bread and I can feed my family. The young plantation owners had to get creative to figure out how to pay the tea pickers fair wages. Tea may be in, but it shouldn't give consumers a bad conscience. And that's why the Berliners Aaron Muro, Sven Bock, and Leon Franken launched their startup Karma Collective. Its mission is to help customers make a difference. People ideally ought to see their wallets as a sort of ballot paper. It lets them proclaim, I choose to support this or that company. And that includes startups aiming to achieve new, positive things. And I think that's what sets them apart. The young entrepreneurs plan to expand their range of products. Their idea is to market very regional, natural teas in returnable bottles. I'm often told things won't work, and that's what's so appealing, trying things that aren't supposed to work, like making bottled drinks. People always say, no way without sugar and preservatives, but it can work, and our approach is to include regional ingredients. Brandenburg is close by for Berliners, and the German capital is full of organic food enthusiasts. So that's why Aaron Muro got in touch with Jörg Justa, who's cultivating 40 hectares of fennel. And that's just one of the flavors of Aaron Muro's new teas. Depending on what the weather allows, you can keep harvesting it for three or four years in a row. And it tastes good. He's nearing his goal of producing tea regionally. Of course, it's really an almost emotional experience, because I know at some point things will be running like clockwork, and that's so nice. His positivity is contagious. We farmers working here at this big farm are actually pretty cut off from the final processing step of our products. I think it's great how this new company is tackling organic products and trying to sell them regionally. That makes them a good partner we're really happy to collaborate with. They only harvest the seeds of the fennel. It takes them two days to dry, and then they're ready for herbal tea. It looks different from the Egyptian varieties, and it looks great in glass. He's planning to pick up 200 kilos of fennel seeds today. If you're new to the business, you first check where you can get fennel, and that was through a vendor in Egypt. Then we approached the farm and they started supplying us, but they were still ultimately located in Egypt. And then I thought, okay, but it'll also grow here in Brandenburg. And ever since then, we've had Brandenburg fennel here. They're still working out the final new tea recipe, but one drink producer nearby has committed to their experiment. And they've had their share of failed attempts, so they have to stay focused. 
Of course, things can go wrong, and we won't know until we taste it. So there's always some tension, and it's about to get hectic, because everything has to be just right, including the brewing time. Besides fennel, the tea mixture includes hibiscus, spearmint, mate, blackberry leaves, and nothing else. Where juicing machines used to make organic juices, there are now tea strainers. What an intense smell, my goodness. It's hibiscus. Achim Fiesinger pasteurizes his juices at 80 degrees Celsius, but that's too low for tea. It needs higher temperatures to release its substances. You don't have a makeshift tea kettle like this in front of you every day, and the processes are different. You first have to learn and get a feeling for how everything works. And have they learned their lessons from their failed attempts so far? Looks good. Hopefully it tastes good too. The bottled tea is supposed to be launched in stores as soon as possible for one euro 79. Cheers. It's slightly acidic, so that helps make it really refreshing. The color is great. I think we can be satisfied. Good job. The contents of the tea strainer used at the juice producer end up in the compost bin to make fertilizer for the next plants and the next experiment. And there will be a next one. One of the world's best-known tea cultivation regions is Assam, India. But Assam has a terrible image. Its name is tarnished by starvation wages and over-exploitation of nature. But there's more to the place than that. Kitan Patel is the third generation owner of the Jalinga Tea Estate. He produces 800 tons of tea a year. His organic tea plantation is the biggest of its kind in India. For me, uh, it has been a very exciting journey uh, because of my overseas exposure with various uh, travels, exhibition participation, interaction with customers, as well in uh, sustainability certifications. I have always been motivated and always taken lear learnings from those and come back and implemented that in Jalinga. India is second only to China in tea cultivation, and the country's potential is enormous. And plantation owner Kitan Patel doesn't intend to rest on his laurels. His ambitious plan is to make the plantation CO2 neutral. The number one climate killer is the black coal traditionally used to dry the tea leaves. And then there are the harvest remains that release climate damaging methane when rotting. Regarding the, uh, the biomass uh, that we collect, uh, we felt obviously that this could be used for a benefit to create energy, whether it's pellets, whether it's composting to, for a soil fertility. They produce a ton of pallets a day enough to substitute most of their black coal. And they soon plan to replace it completely, which could help lower annual CO2 emissions by 2,300 tons. As you can see, the output is slow. Right. So the output has to be much faster. Yeah. Organic energy instead of waste. That's just one of the many ideas Kitan Patel is implementing to make his Jalinga tea estate more climate friendly. The reason is one is the, the green alternative, it is environment friendly, but the second also is that it will also reduce my tea production cost by 15%. So basically it's a win-win for the industry as well as the environment. And to protect the environment even more, he aims to reduce his tea garden's CO2 emissions by another 1,000 tons a year. Tea picker Shankari Gowala lives on the plantation with her family and she's been cooking over an open fire so far. But that's bad for the climate and the people. So the plantation owner is giving 1,500 families a little gift with a big impact. This is for you to cook with. This efficient wood oven doesn't smolder, and it's good for your health. Obviously, 
Climate protection starts small, and every little bit helps. Despite having to learn a new language and writing system, Christina Mehik quickly felt at home in Georgia. <laughs> the Estonian has new ideas, while Mizia Kinsurashvili has old stories from back when Georgia was still part of the Soviet Union. Tea was very important back then. It smelled so good. Tea was exported abroad. We got bonuses and had great working conditions. Working on the tea plantations, you were financially secure. It was a happy time for Mizia Kinsurashvili. That was over 30 years ago. <laughs> when the Soviet Union broke apart, we had no more income. The plantations became wild. And because we weren't earning enough anymore, my son went abroad. We've only managed to make ends meet through his financial support. The tea producer pays above average wages during the five-month harvest season, and that enables employees to make a living for the rest of the year. It's one of the best so far. In the first year, they harvested 10 kilos, and now in year four, they expect two tons. Hannes Zarpu from Estonia has tough work days, but he says it would be too harmful to the environment to use machines to dry the leaves. In the big tea factories, there is also like those machines, like where you put like a lot of leaves and it's like forced, uh, like air ventilation and, and also they sometimes heat. So, for example, when it takes for us like, well, with the current weather, maybe 15 hours, 20 hours, then in those big factories, it takes maybe two hours, three hours and the leaf is ready to go. Green, black and white tea are made from the same plant, Camellia sinensis. They're just processed differently and the staff do everything themselves here, from drying and rolling the leaves to packing and shipping the finished tea. That way, the money stays at the farm. Now it comes in the beginning, but... Their prices start at six euros for 50 grams of tea. Ethical production comes at a cost. When we started to look into the industry and then how it works, that uh, the farmers almost don't get anything. The people actually making the tea in the factories, they don't almost get anything. And, and it just turns around because uh, like if you like this mass market uh, teas, they are sold in the, in the global market, maybe $3 a kilo, $4 a kilo. Only blocking cost for us, like the, those ladies who are harvesting the leaves. <laughs> About 86% of the sales price in Germany goes to the supermarkets and tea production companies, while workers in the Indian state of Assam, for instance, receive just 1.4% according to an Oxfam study. The owners of the plantation in Georgia wanted to avoid such conditions in their own business. That's why they thought up their own special business model. In Assam, plantation owner Kitan Patel distributed 4,000 of the new climate-friendly wood ovens, and the families of the tea pickers are trying them out. Will they become well-established, like the ingenious plantation owner hopes? Sister, you like cooking with this stove? This stove is better than the old one. It takes less wood to cook and cooks faster. We need four kilos of wood for this one, and we used to need ten. And that lowers CO2 emissions. And even for the charred wood left over, the plantation owner has an idea. The families can sell it to the plantation and then the charcoal can be used to dry out the tea leaves instead of the climate-damaging black coal. 25 kilos times 400, that makes 100 rupees. 
This new stove helps us earn some money by selling the leftover coals to the tea plantation. And my family benefits from the additional income. Kitan Patel's ingenuity to lower CO2 emissions knows no limits. The plantation is already preparing for its next project, sponsored by German climate organization Atmosphere. Four different compost mixtures are being enriched with environmental bio-coal. So what mix makes the best fertilizer? Project manager Somesh Dutta is hoping this effort will boost tea yields by up to 30 percent. We'll see the comparison, how the soil has been developed in terms of water holding capacity, soil porosity, and the pH value of the soil. And we'll compare with the each and every block, with the four blocks, which, which one is giving the best, better result. Their ambitious goal is to only consume what the farm produces itself. And for plantation owner Kitan Patel, it's a question of survival. That's the only way you can do organic in a competitive way and th having a long-term perspective in terms of climate and environment. There are thousands of tea plantations in India, but climate visionaries like Kitan Patel still have a lot of convincing to do. In their adopted home of Georgia, the Baltic tea farmers have thought up an unusual business model. They sell plots of their land online, and there are already 169 virtual buyers from 21 countries. The demand is so enormous that they constantly have to clear new parts of their Soviet-era plantation. Nice tea is People are uh, basically buying uh, part of uh, our plantation, like a small plot. And, uh, well, they do not become owners of this plot, but uh, they get uh, half of the tea which is produced from that plot for 25 years. So if we, for example, produce like 20 kilos of tea, then the owner of this plot gets uh, 10 kilos of tea at the end of the season. They encourage customer loyalty by adding personalized name signs in the middle of Georgia. Christina Mehik and the others named their farm Renegade to emphasize their alternative ways. We hope that people with their own tea bushes uh, feel kind of part of it and, uh, and they feel closer to nature and they, they actually get this really personal experience that they know who their own tea farmers are. Philip Bienek from Germany works for a humanitarian foundation in Kutaisi, and he gave his parents their own tea bush. Now he's taking a look at it. Yeah, it's just the next Robert. one. Okay, I see. <laughs> oh, that's cool. It costs 75 euros to sponsor a bush, and in exchange, he receives three different packages of tea a year. So people can donate to support a great idea and promote a kinder economy. We could all pitch in to some extent and help food and drink businesses take a look outside the city a bit. And there are many options in Germany and internationally. So people ought to better understand the work behind it all and how it's about more than just a tea bag. You drink it fast and then throw it away fast, but when you see how it comes from a tea leaf and all the work that goes into it and who did it, you'll maybe enjoy it more and be less wasteful. These idealistic visions have many supporters because the renegade farm gives them a look behind the scenes of the tea business and they can see just how hard it is to compete with low-cost tea brands. And this makes also sure that we can actually pay our uh, workers normally, because we like uh, we kick out the middlemen, basically, who, who usually take the, the money. So I, I hope that this kind of system, not only in tea, but in food in general, would go wider, so people... Of course, the products are more expensive then, but uh, I hope that, uh, in general, people would maybe consume less 
but consume like more high quality and sustainable products. There's a lot you can do for a good cup of tea.